And I was always super scared of her. You know, she was a fixture at the Dakota. She'd be at the bar kind of with her arms folded, you know, like watching the new young person. She meant business. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She was she was like the the benchmark of talent in, in town. And this podcast is about you, your journey in music. And we'll talk all about uh, the new Christmas record you have coming out. Awesome. Happy to be here, bro. Cool, cool. My name is Adam, by the way. Um, so first off, Tom, why don't you tell, tell me about where you were born and raised? Born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, famously the home of Prince. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Though I got to shout out the 1987 uh, Minnesota Twins as well. You know, World Series champs. Oh, sure, oh. sure. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are you big I was there, I was at no? game four. No, nah, I mean not really, but like I was at game four, and you know, there's not a lot of exciting things that happen in Minnesota, if I'm being yeah. honest. So that was a big moment. You know what I mean? Wow, you got to go to the game. It was amazing. I mean, you know, it was like Kent Herbeck, Kirby Puckett. It was like the classic yeah. lineup. And you know, Minnesotans are not um exuberant people in general. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I was a kid, you know, I was like nine years old. And I remember just the streets of Minneapolis, like exploding, like people jumping on cars and stuff. Like, I mean, you know, I don't think it's ever happened since then, but it was cool to see. That's just like a, a Tuesday in New York. You know what I mean? But right, like, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but to see a town yeah. going off like that. Um, I have family in Cleveland and when the Cavs won the championship, it was like, it, the whole thing erupted. I, I was exactly. in there, but I, I was in San Francisco when the Giants won it like three times, which was cool. But they had won so many things that wasn't the same as like Minneapolis winning something or you yeah. know Cleveland winning something. Like I, that, that must have been really, really cool to be a part of. Exactly, like being being from a place where people don't know where it is on a map. You know? <laughs> sure, yeah, that, exactly. That's funny. That's always funny. That's yeah. cool. So, so growing up there was pretty cool. Like, what about music wise? Obviously, Prince is from there. Were you? Uh, when did you get into music? I mean, I, right away. You know, it, it's funny because um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, just with the pandemic and all this time on our our, our hands. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Jets were there. I don't know if you remember the Jets. They had like a huge hit, and Prince and all of his kind of like teams had all these parties and singles and things happening all the time. So even though I was a little kid there was a lot of music happening. The rock mm -hmm. scene obviously was huge. Um, mm -hmm. But what really kind of got me was this jazz scene from Chicago. There are all these like really cool musicians from Detroit and Chicago mm -hmm. who became my mentors um, when I was about 17, 18 and kind of took me under their wing and really started showing me like, kind of like really out stuff like Albert Eiler, Alice Coltrane, you know, not not the stuff I knew, not, mm -hmm. you know, Ella and Miles, but like the stuff that's like, you know, a little more challenging. And um, so that was kind of cool. I got like a really radical kind of musical education in that way. And the jazz community to this day is is really outstanding. The musicianship is super high. Mm -hmm. um, and also the singers there. I got to shout out Debbie Duncan, who passed away during the pandemic. She was an L.A. transplant who was super bad and I was always super scared of her you know she was a fixture at the Dakota she'd be at the bar kind of with her arms folded you know like watching the new young person she meant business <laughs> yeah yeah she was she was like the the benchmark of talent in, in town and you know I, I became friends with her and she looked after me too so I gotta say you know Minneapolis and St. Paul is like a really supportive artistic network Mm -hmm. that I uh, was you know, honored to be a part of, for sure. You, you talked about uh, mentors of yours coming from Detroit and uh, and Chicago and stuff. Were those, did you meet these people as they're coming through Minneapolis when you're going to see them play for shows? Like how, how did you end up meeting up with these people? Well, there are all these families. There are all these like musical families. There's the Peterson family mm -hmm. from Minnesota. Um, there's the Washingtons who are from Detroit. So a lot of people will know um, James Carter, the saxophone player. Mm -hmm. His mentor is Donald Washington. And he's, he's the closest I've heard to hearing John Coltrane in a person. Really? 
Wow. He's, nobody knows him. Like he's not known outside of musician circles, but he's mm-hmm. like absolutely incredible. And his son, Kevin, is an incredible drummer and his wife, Faye, sings opera and plays flute. So I remember going to their house um, with Douglas Ewart, who's like a part of, he's from Chicago, from the AACM, um, Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot of these guys living there, you know, um, because it's easier than Chicago. You can buy a house and a car. Right, and of eight. course, yeah. And, you know, I remember just going over to Donald's house and seeing like, you know, his collection of like 10,000 vinyl, you wow. know what I mean? And like, he's like, oh yeah, like Archie Shep gave me this, you know, like this horn and you know what I mean? Like, and I was like 17, which is like, I didn't even know who these guys were. Like they were referencing people that I didn't even know, like Muhal, Richard Abrams and Archie Shep and, you know, this post Coltrane, mm-hmm. um, like late seventies thing that they were like a part of and, and knew. So that was, that was mind blowing. And I'm still in touch with those guys. Um, and then there's, I got to shout out Louis Alamayu and Carrie Thomas. Louis is a, a performance poet from Chicago. Carrie is also from Chicago. Carrie, if, if we're going really deep, used to sing with Sun Ra. So like, you know what I mean? Like, wow, mm-hmm. like super, super <laughs> yeah. in it. Right, um, so right, right. Guys, yeah, those guys moved to Minneapolis and they started a band called Ancestor Energy, which is like an 11 piece performance jazz improvisational composition ensemble like stuff that really radical stuff that like doesn't really exist in most places and I just Uh happened to stumble on it and they were like yo you're cool like let's go you know wow that's incredible how did you get into the into the scene was because you're obviously a fantastic singer is that where you started was vocals or did you play an instrument, piano, anything like that before? It was vocals. Um, I, I played a little bit of guitar in high school, but I honestly didn't have like the discipline. I think like the, like, well, Bobby McFerrin was also in Minneapolis at the time. He was, um, he was at the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. He was the artistic director. So I would see him around town and you know, he was like my hero. He still is my hero vocally. So, you know, he kind of made singing seem like singing jazz looked very cool and like he was getting paid and he was had dreads you know what I mean like yeah yeah he was he was totally doing his his own thing even then and um so I I played a little guitar but you know it wasn't really I wasn't really disciplined you know I, I honestly just wanted to like do shows meet girls make some money that's that's how i got it you know <laughs> i feel like that's how everybody kind of gets into it really yeah so did were and, you in like chorus and choir and stuff in middle school high school elementary school i was a super like choir nerd like i was like the one guy in all the choirs so at first i went to a catholic high school okay so i sang all of the sort of like vivaldi the repertoire the, exactly mm-hmm. the gloria and all that stuff Mm -hmm. And I liked it. You know, I really, I really enjoyed it because we sang it not only in the classroom, but we'd also sang for like masses and in Mm -hmm. church. And that was kind of like, that was one of the first times I got to see music in a non-commercial way and see how it could be part of like a ritual. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, I mean, I guess that connects to, to Christmas too, because, you know, I would sing with my mom or like, you know, the family stuff, like, Christmas carols we we weren't like you know walking down the streets like with candles like missionaries you know Uh, (laughs) we definitely you aren't caroling door to door no it wasn't it wasn't like (laughs) like that but you know we definitely had fun and and sang along to the radio and stuff so it was all just kind of natural but I didn't really think of myself as like a performer performer until I'm gonna I'm gonna embarrass myself now I was um the lead in my high school musical Prince of uh, Cinderella. I was Prince Charming. Oh, that's awesome. Absolutely terrible, but they gave me the role. And I remember after that show, all of these parents like mobbed me. I was like mm-hmm. 16. And all these like parents ran up to me and they were like, oh my God, like you're so good. And I was like, oh, like I guess I have like some talent. You know, that was the first time that 
I had done a performance and it was like, I got feedback from mm-hmm. people. It resonated with people. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of took it seriously. And, and, you know, also like hip hop was exploding too. Um, so I was like, no, oh, I really wanted rap. And I wasn't really sure like how to go forward. And then I, I kind of met all these guys who were these deep jazz guys and they kind of put it all together with the poetry and the jazz um, and plus, by that time, I, I really knew like my standards and all the traditional stuff. So it felt like the right direction. And, and I never looked back, basically, you know. You attended, uh, you went to the new school, correct? In New York? Yeah, I went to the new school, which was an awesome time in terms of who was there. I mean, just the level of people who were graduating as I entered, you know, that's where I met Takuya Kuroda. Robert Glasper was just leaving. Bilal was just leaving. It was it was quite a um, it's kind of hard to describe, but it, it was pretty like it was like anarchy. You know, it was like <laughs> it, there were there were classes and schedules, but it was really just hanging out with like, you know, Bernard Purdy was there. Junior Mance was there. Uh, Chico Hamilton, you know, who founded it was there. Um, it was like all of these jazz legends and then all of these insanely talented peers, you know, like everybody was really good. Whether I sort of realized it or not, you know, looking back on it, it's like, wow, like the level was really high, you know, and I feel incredibly lucky. And I wrote my first song there, the song, The Dreamer. Yeah. Which became the debut record. Exactly. So that album is basically just me messing around at school, like, you know, on the piano. And that was the first song I wrote with words was The Dreamer, actually. Really? Yeah. Do you remember showing that to people for the first time? Um, I, like I think song? I showed it to my band. I think I did it like the Miles Davis style. Where I didn't like tell anyone. And I just like <laughs> had the, the session and they're like, what do you want to play? And I was like, oh, it's just like G major down to F major. And it's in five. And they're like, oh, that's weird. All right. And then we just played it and that was kind of it, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very like secretive about showing my stuff. You know, I'm basically these days, I only share it with uh, my partner, writing partner, life partner, Talia Billy, who wrote, you know, the Christmas, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, the mm-hmm. Christmas in New York song. She sees my stuff early and pretty much nobody else does. I, you know, I usually <laughs> show the session with like a very minimal demo um for the band you know because yeah i don't know like it's a good question i, I i'm not really um i don't know how to describe it i don't, it's hard to share that process you know right I mean, I you gotta be really vulnerable right yeah Shit. exactly and i'm and it, when i'm in that zone like if somebody tells me like "Ooh, that chord's not right it'll just send me into a whole like rabbit hole of like self-doubt you know so like i have to be super disciplined about it so once you had that one song done like when do you start working on the which became what became the first record did you finish school like what was kind of the next step for you after you started attending the new school basically um after the first year i ran out of money and i was like well i want to stay here so i just took a job there was this cool dude Mike Campagna, who's a sax player who I've been on tour with a lot. He's in Miami now. Mm -hmm. And he gave me the job um, in the equipment room. So I just basically hung out from like 5 p.m. till midnight, listening to like Coltrane and like, (laughs) like Tribe Call Quest and like checking out amps to my band and getting, it was a union job. It was actually amazing. And it's funny because later I read that like, you know, Spike Lee had to do the same thing at NYU. Really? I was like, all right, this is, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's cool. He did it yeah. right on. <laughs> exactly. And um, you know, I just I just worked on the album. Um, I made a, a EP. It got over to London and Giles Peterson heard it. He loved it. And we had done a version of Equinox, John Coltrane's Equinox, which was like his favorite Coltrane song. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. So he signed me to Brownswood and he basically was just like. I was, I think I was the only American artist on the, the label at the time. And he was like, yeah, do what you want to do, you know? So I ended up self-producing the entire album, 
which was really cool of him. He was just like, yeah, like do whatever you want, like turn in something in like a month. And so I just like wow. moved through the money and did, did like epic sessions with, <laughs> you know, I think I recorded about 30 tracks actually. Um, really? Yeah. And only, only 10 of them are good. <laughs> That's crazy. So what was it like being signed to, to, I mean, getting signed like that? It was very unexpected, to be honest. You know, um, mm -hmm. I had no idea that that label existed. Nobody did. It was like a secret at the time. And it just felt like really, um, there are these moments in my life and they happen to be centered around John Coltrane often, mm -hmm. where I feel like just like the hand of God kind of just kind of came in and moved me somewhere you know I mean if I told you the whole story like you wouldn't believe it I was over there for a jazz competition which I didn't even make it to the semifinals you know and, and I was like the exchange rate was two to one in the pound was like crazy and I was like super broke I literally had five pounds left in my my wallet and I went to get a glass of wine near the, the venue where we had the competition and the bartender, I, I should actually find this guy because he's like changed my life. He was like, hey, you know, where are you from? You know, UK guys are so nice and chatty. He said, oh, you're from New York. What do you do? You're a jazz singer. And I said, yeah, here's my EP. And then he just put it on in the, in the bar. Wow. He like, yeah, he like paused the music. He was playing like Miles Davis. He took it off, put on my EP, and he was like, let's check it out. I was like, okay, awesome. Like that would never happen in a million years in, in New York. You know what I mean? No way. Yeah. <laughs> no. And then, and then a dude came up and he was like, yo, this is amazing. The bartender said, that's you. This guy knew Giles. He gave the EP to Giles and that's how it all kind of kicked off. So it all felt very like, wow. like magical. You know what I mean? It was very surreal. It was very, very surreal. And you know, I have to say, like, being with Giles in London at that time was super cool because, like, dubstep was just emerging and he mm -hmm. knew Banga and Koki and, like, all those guys who were literally creating this. Mm -hmm. And they were giving him, like, demos and, and dub plates and white labels. And I was living at Brownswood for quite a while, off and on. It was, like, Giles' second house. Mm -hmm. And... um you know, it was, it was pretty cool. Like it was, it was the closest that I think I'll ever have to like experiencing what somebody felt like, you know, watching the folk scene explode like mm -hmm. in the sixties or watching Coltrane, you know, in the fifties or miles, like being there, like being at plastic people, this famous club in shortage in that time, you know, 2006, 2007, eight, and watching people like floating points and these people just like, you know, creating electronically night after night um, with this new music. Like it, that's to me, that's the same feeling as jazz. They didn't like have set lists, you know, they came in and they would like, they would make yeah. something that day and then they would play it in the club. Yeah. They improvise cool. it a bit. That's so yeah. cool. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. I didn't really, yeah. That you were kind of in that when it was all, really really blowing up here in the uk when that was happening it was super cool and then at the same time you know robert glasper was coming out with his stuff with chris dave and people like taylor mcferrin so there was this kind of like embrace of this new york jazz scene in london specifically at the same time mm -hmm. um so it all it, to me it was all really connected and then flying lotus had come out with his reset ep and i met him there and that's how we started working on black magic the, the follow-up album um, yeah he so it was, produced it, was it like with a, you find that it was, did they produce a record yeah he produced um four tracks on it we ended up using three one one he said was too weird which coming from him <laughs> coming from him huh? yeah i was like wow i really i've really i've, I've cracked the code i guess if it's right. too weird for, for steve um funny yeah so it was you know london's always been super cool man like they're really open and I feel like the genres are blurred there. So I think that's why I was able to make these kind of albums that are like they're jazz, but there are, there's a lot of other influences yeah, elements in there. Sure. And you can, yeah. yeah, you can hear that in the records too. And so yeah, exactly. when, yeah. And then you, after, after that record came out, like 
you were were you playing in the UK like pretty regularly at this point? Like, were you going back and forth from New York to the UK pretty pretty often? I was going back and forth so much that I just moved there. Actually. Oh, you ended up moving there. Okay. Yeah, like in 2009 to 10, I just lived there. Um, and it was amazing. You know, I, I really uh, I have to say, especially in this post-Brexit world, I feel very fortunate to have been there before that. And, um, you know, met so many cool artists too, you know, like Richard Spaven, who I'm on tour with right now, of the great drummer and producer, Shabaka Hutchins, you know, like, whose Sons of Kemet band is blowing up now. Like, there's so many awesome people. Jules Buckley, who's like an enormous arranger now, does all the BBC prom stuff. Um, he was just another bandmate. He was like signed on Brownswood with, with his orchestra. And that's how we met. So, you know, when it's happening, you, you're, you're, it's just like, it feels normal. You're not like, oh, this is exceptional. And then you look back and you're like, wow, this was actually super crazy you know mm -hmm. for sure for sure and you said you're out there for a year and then what did you move back to new york after that i was out there for like a year and a half and then i moved back to new york in like 2010 um and yeah you know i signed with verve as well and they put out a record on impulse yeah which coltrane was on right that was one of his the they put out his record exactly it was a it was a big moment it was a big moment. tell me about that crazy. yeah i want to hear about that that's crazy well i mean it's this it's this idea that i keep thinking about you know like coltrane there's a, a, a thread of his spirit through my my life and career somehow mm -hmm. you know um i had made this album in belgium with this great pianist jeff neve we just recorded it ourselves in a day in this gorgeous studio like the best studio in in belgium and he basically leaked it to his people at Universal. And they're like, we got to have this. And Universal's, Universal uh, Europe heard about it. And they're like, we're going to sign it. And then New York heard about it. And they're like, no, we love Jose. We're going to sign him. So it became this thing. Like a bidding war? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and they signed it. And, you know, I mean, it was just like a lifelong dream, man, to be on. I mean, I'm such a jazz nerd, you know, so to, to be signed to Verve. And then for them to reactivate Impulse, you know, before me, it was Alice Coltrane was the last artist on Impulse, which is like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so to have that experience in Minneapolis with this Black radical collective who taught me about these albums, then to actually be on the label doing my jazz was awesome. And, you know, then I was kind of like, how do I put all of this together? Because I think I move a bit too fast sometimes for the critics and for my audience, you know, and you put a lot of records out, you know, and in, in a, not a short span of time, but for compared to most bands. You know yeah. What I mean? yeah. I mean, it's basically like an album a year, you know, which mm -hmm. is like I'm, I'm comfortable with, but people I sometimes get confused because it's like, what's well, very traditional jazz or it's like future R and B or it's like, bill withers tribute it's like well which which is it and for me it's all of it you know it's not it's just whatever i'm into at that moment um and i think now people get it but i, I think i needed to show one record that kind of showed the fullness of my scope and that was no beginning no end one uh, which ended up on blue note with don was mm -hmm. so it, it was kind of a similar thing to giles like don had taken over and it was kind of like a new thing. And I just happened to have some music ready. You know, I had already produced um, four tracks with, you know, I, again, I didn't plan it, but it was like kind of a who's who of people on Blue Note. It was Hindi Zara who was on Blue Note France. It was um, Robert Glasper, you know, like mm -hmm. it was like a perfect way to, to get in, you know, um, strategically but i didn't think about it like that it just worked out like that and you know and i had met pino paladino in london uh through a mutual friend and so we became friends we started writing together and it just came out of like writing sessions at pino's house he's got a great studio in london you know he just super chill he pulls out the bass 
you know, Rose went up and he's like, let's, let's hit record. And, <laughs> you know, we wrote a song together called make it right in 15 minutes. And I'm not, wow. a, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a fast write, um, songwriter, but for some reason with Pino, just it clicked. just clicked in and he was like, man, like, this is going to be a great album. And I was like, what do you mean? He was like, well, I'm doing your album. I just met him that day. <laughs> Like, I was already, <laughs> I was already, I was already so freaked out. You know what I mean? Because I'm like such a D'Angelo fan and Voodoo and the whole thing, like everybody. Mm -hmm. So I was already just like freaked out to meet him, let alone like be at his house, let alone like be in his studio. You know, I'm looking at his like bass collection. I mean, I'm a, I'm a nerd. I'm a music nerd. So my brain is just exploding. And and then we're, all of a sudden we're like writing a song, and then that would have been enough for me, honestly. Right. But he's like, yeah. I'm gonna do your album. And I was like, <laughs> "Hey, man!" Like, I was like, "Hey, like, I, you know, like, there's there isn't an album. Like, I don't know what do you mean." He was like, "It's gonna be a great album." And I was like, "All right." He's like, like, "I'm doing your album." And I was like, "Hey, like, okay. sure, let's do you know it." I mean? like, like well, all we have is this one song we just wrote 15 minutes ago. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, I mean, when Pino Palladino was like, I want to do your album, obviously you're like, well, I, I guess. And so he actually argued that, right? <laughs> yeah. He organized the first session um, at um, the Magic Shop where Arcade Fire had just recorded. It's gone now in, uh, in Manhattan. Oh, wow. Amazing studio. And Russ Olivato did the first sec you know, session, and it was Chris Dave and Robert Glasper. I mean, it was just like, wow. Even saying it now, like I'm, I'm, I can hardly believe it. It was, it was really, really crazy and really expensive. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And we just, you know, it, it was, it was super cool and super easy, you know, like working with people on that level um, is great, you know, and I think that I've actually had three constant writing partners, you know, Talia, mm -hmm. um, you know, and Scott Jacoby, who's a producer in New York, who wrote like Trouble and mm -hmm. kind of more like funk stuff. Those three people are sort of like my like go to, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it has a vibe of like, like he'll pull the musicians together and he'll jam and he'll get like a super cool like bass. Like um, he wrote on Turn, Turn It Up, Turn Me Up on No Beginning 2 with Aloe and, and Tali. Mm -hmm. um, and then Tali is like, she's like the closer, you know, like I have an idea and I, I like take it to a certain point and then she comes in and just like masterfully like puts it all together and like ties it sees up. All the, <laughs> yeah, like everything that it needs and, you know, yeah, ends up putting a story to it. Like I'm not great at like storytelling mm -hmm. in a linear way the way she is like she's so analytical and it's you know she's an incredible lyricist you know it's, it's I, I mean i think i'm pretty good with words but she's a lyricist if you know what okay. i mean sure sure um, so she can kind of like step back and look at a song and be like well what are we trying to say here and i'm like i don't know it sounds cool you know mm -hmm. like that kind of vibe um, all right and when and, you put out oh sorry go ahead yeah no and then just scott jacoby just brings out like the prince side of me somehow you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was yeah. gonna say you put out no beginning, no end too uh, on your own label, right? You created your own label at this. At we, yeah, we did. We did. Um, I started with with Tali, and basically, I got the the rights back to my Brownswood album, so everything came full circle. Mm -hmm. So we put out the Dreamer, and we released we released that, and then Talia was like, you know, I think we should really go global with this. And not and make it like a thing so she's really the brains behind like the the heart and the vision of the label and no beginning no end two was like man I, i'm still i'm still trying to come to grips with like the talent on that record you know it's basically it's just everybody i wanted to work with in the world and i just called everybody and they were all like yes you know it was like aloe black lettuce -y, you know, Justin Brown, um, Jamire Williams, you know, Pino, like 
Eric Truffaz from France, you know, Hindi Zara again. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it was and is like one of my favorite experiences. And I can't even call it an album because it was, it was an experience. You know, we recorded it in LA and in Brooklyn and um, yeah. And, you know, of course we didn't know like the pandemic was coming. <laughs> right. Did you put it out before the pandemic? We put it out literally like, as the pandemic was driving, it was like March, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. yeah. So that sucked, obviously. Oh, man. Um, but, you know, like, it's funny because I'm actually on tour for that now, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. It's taken Yeah. Up. I know. It's um, wild to see. I, I, even looking at like festival lineups, it's like, huh. Like so the, some of the, the major headliners, like if you look at it a couple of years later, you're like now if they were to book it, it would probably be uh, like Olivia Rodrigo, the headliner of like h- half the festivals. <laughs> but exactly. Lizzo had such a big record at the time that it, she was headlining like everything. <laughs> and then it was, exactly. It's just funny yeah. to see how that, that kind of happens. But well, at least you're able to tour it now. I mean, that, that yeah, only took I mean, a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Like Rainbow Blonde has been such a incredible gift you know and one that i didn't know that i needed as an artist Mm -hmm. um it's definitely changed my my writing and it's changed my even my production like i I mean i've always written and produced most of my albums you know my my solo work uh, Mm -hmm. or co-produce but now that it's our own label it's just kind of like whatever like really ultra musical choice we want to make just gets made you know like i had issues at blue note with like the vinyl quality and it was like oh yeah but like we don't have time to fix it you know and i'm like well then fucking delay the album then you know what i mean that's <laughs> right <laughs> you know what i mean but it, yeah. it, it, and all love like i mean I, I love blue note and i love don you know and but it's a difference working with like a corporate thing rather than your own thing where it's like we're like oh yeah the vinyl has to be perfect and amazing we will do you know five test pressings if we need to Mm -hmm. and we you know we go to abbey road and it's like oh wow that's yeah you're doing there wow yeah so it's you know it's um it's a whole different thing man and it just feels like feels like home when it's on your label you're just like yeah it's cool it's it's there it's there forever and i know i know where it lives and i know who wants it and I feel like so grateful. I mean, we kind of have like a kind of a Motown situation a bit because um, we also work with Brian Bender who's produced or co-produced a lot of my records um, and a lot of records in our scene. Mm -hmm. So we have him, we have Jeanette Beckman, the amazing legendary music photographer. She's our house photographer. That's cool. Yeah, you know, it's like I, I grew up seeing all her stuff for Def Jam and Mm-hmm. you know what I mean and like now to just hang with her and talk about LL Cool J and then she's like all right well, what are we doing for Tali you know what I mean it's like it's just it's being surrounded by pure music people um and that's kind of like how we roll you know mm-hmm. there's no there's no artifice it's just what you see is what you get on the record and off the record I love that I love that yeah. well, I want to talk to you about uh, Christmas in New York that's the newest song and it's going to be part of your the record, Merry Christmas from Jose. So is that what kind of kicked off the Christmas vibe? I mean, tell me about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like like most great Christmas songs, it was written in Los Angeles in the summer. <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. That makes and, sense. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Talia was was living in LA. She was doing a lot of um like pop top line writing and cool collaborations she was there for two years so I, I was there I think I was out on a trip visiting her and we're at her uncle's house and he has this incredible Fazioli piano that just you sit down and even if you're like I'm not a pianist but you sit down at it and you just feel like Nat King Cole you know just immediately you know mm-hmm. and I had this little idea um and I was just kind of like jotting it down and I was like I think this is a Christmas song you know <laughs> And a Christmas song is kind of like the the elusive, you know, like elusive thing. Like everybody like wants to write a Christmas song and like nobody can because it's 
there's no way to do it without but sounding there's like there's just too many good ones right <laughs> there's too <yeah>. many classics <laughs> too many classics man and 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 the level is high actually you know really high when you really i mean i've i've listened to more christmas songs in the last two years than i'm i don't know i like there are a you lot to. <laughs> i mean it, it's it's fascinating you know i really i really nerded out on the whole process but with christmas in new york um so i had this uh, this melody you know da 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 di da 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 di da di do da do di do da 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 and i was thinking like this kind of sounds like a like a standard like a great american songbook form you know mm -hmm. and it was unusual too because i don't I rarely hear the full melody. Usually I have like a little idea, like a little cell of a thing and a couple of chords and I expand it. But on this one, I kind of heard the whole form. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember saying to Tali, like, hey, I need to help on the song. Like, I think it's a Christmas song, you know? And we started working on it, you know, again in LA, you know, nothing, no Christmas references around us, you know? Right, and we had that. Yeah, it, we just had that first line, you know, like Christmas time is coming through the air, you know. Um, and we were kind of getting stuck on it. And she said, why don't you try singing it like Nat King Cole? And that was that was the way we, we made it through. You know, I started I started singing it in his style and it, the words just came like flowing out. And, you know, I, I really. I think it's one of the best things that she and I have done together. Um, mm -hmm. I'm very curious to hear what people think about it. And I was a little nervous to include it on the album with all these other just like Christmas standards, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I kind of, I kind of, I'm, I'm feeling it. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm going to, I'm, cool. I'm, I'm in the hip hop generation. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put myself out there. Like, and we'll, we'll see, you know what I mean? Yeah, I love it. I love it. And how did you decide on the songs, the, the remaining songs on the record, like the classics? You know what? We just went through, I mean, at least six months of like going through records from like the 30s till today. Okay. And I really wanted I really wanted to have something that felt like the 1950s now, you know, like I wanted that sort of like jazz americana sinatra like if you could imagine frank sinatra sitting in with miles davis that's what i wanted it to feel like you okay. know what i mean yeah yeah yeah. Like, like totally accessible totally like you know like bing crosby in your you know in your uh, in your home you know like mm -hmm. on a friday night on television but also like very black cool you know like modern jazz and i think we hit it and and so I knew the songs had to be just the best. So to me, this is my selection of like the creme de la creme of like the great American songbook of Christmas, basically. I love it. And you had your daughter on the record too. Man. And she's mad because she wanted Jingle Bells. She was like, <laughs> Daddy, but you didn't really Christmas? Like, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, she, uh, it was funny because I said, hey, you know, you should you should do something on the album you know she's eight you know yeah and so i was thinking she was going to play like a little tambourine or like you know what i'm saying like triangle a little, or the yeah a triangle <laughs> and she's like i'm singing right and i was like um i mean yeah probably you know <laughs> probably and she was like i'm gonna sing and we were like all right and so tali trained her in, and and coached her on this christmas and i have to say she was so good like she was such a pro and we brought the like Neumann down you know like way down and she had her headphones on and she was like so serious about it and she killed it she did like one take wow yeah and the band like she walked into the control room and everyone just like burst into applause and they're like whoa like she okay just drops the mic <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> she just jumped in her jag and just like drove off <laughs> Make sure I get credit on that. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> That's so awesome. That's so cool to include her on the record, though. That's that. What a special moment. It was really cool. It was really special. I'll never forget it. It was really awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. That is awesome. And then you're you're not doing the tour 
right now for the Christmas record, right? You're 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 touring the other record that had came out COVID time, and then you're going to kick off a Christmas tour. Exactly. Yeah, so starting t- in San Francisco. How are you yeah, doing so- that? Is it going to just be more of like a like a like all Christmas songs, or are you going to incorporate your other songs? Like, how are you going to do it? I think it's going to be Christmas songs, but we're going to stretch them out and and actually let the jazz part come out, you know, which we weren't able to do on the album uh-huh. for, for vinyl reasons. You know what I mean? Of course. Um, <laughs> and we also recorded everything to tape too. So really that is, yeah. rad. no one's doing that anymore, man. We, um, I know we don't have like a ton of time, but we recorded everything to two inch tape and mixed down to two inch tape as well. Whoa. That is yeah. so cool. That is so cool. It was amazing. Yeah. I, and very scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You can't make a mistake, you know? You're like, if I screw up, this is going to cost a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's exactly. When you're the label, you know. You're like, oh, my God. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Especially as you're putting it out yourself. You're like, oh, exactly. yeah, Universal's got this. <laughs> exactly uh, wow yeah. that is so rad that is so rad i can't wait to hear the rest of the record it's coming out in a couple of weeks right About it's right around the half? corner man. yeah yeah i'm, I'm I excited it's November. like what's going on <laughs> i know i know yeah so and, that's super um, yeah. exciting we you know my favorite things on there tribute to coltrane and to um mccoy so again there's the coltrane thread yeah i love it i love it and thank you so much jose for doing this i really really appreciate your time um, my last question for you is if you have any advice for aspiring artists. So much, you know, I mean, it, it really, I think there's always like a small voice that only we can hear and it urges us on and it gives us encouragement and it gives us, um, ideas and it's really, really crucial to listen to that voice all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's easy when you know, when, when things are popping off to kind of forget about that voice and it's easy to forget about that voice when things aren't popping off, you know, but that voice has guided me to everything good in my life. Um, and yeah, it's the same voice that I heard when I was a little kid listening to, you know, off the wall and, and purple rain. And it's the same thing that tells me like, man, you gotta, you gotta do a Christmas record to two inch tape. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and it, it, it's always right. And I feel like, yeah, any artist who listens to that voice will never go wrong. Bring me a bad word.